to think that you can just read a book and figure out how to dismantle all of these unconscious complexes is a is a is a fantasy. Here we go. What is up? Just giving a moment for peeps to just jump right on. We are talking about why we don't choose the right partners. Why we choose, it seems like we are constantly choosing the wrong people. I just want to make sure that my tech is working. Uh, I don't. I, I'm not guaranteed of that. I just want to make sure. Um, let's see. Audio roadcaster. Cool. Awesome. That seems to work. If, um, if it's working, then great. If it's not, I'm sure somebody will let me know. Um, I've had some challenges with, uh, with audio as of late, but hopefully this works. Welcome. Uh, I'm speaking today about, uh, some questions that have been coming up in our cycle breakers portal, which is a really neat offer that we just put out for people who just want to dip their toe into this, um, this methodology that's different to see what's different about it. In the realm of relationships, we try a lot of things to get this area of our life aligned. Uh, and for good reason, uh, we all want healthy relationships. We all want relationships that feel nourishing, that feel safe, that uh, we feel like we're, we're able to fully express ourselves, uh, that we don't have to feel like we are, you know, having to perform uh, or fix or be a certain way in order to feel lovable. We all desperately want that. And um, I didn't think I did until I had everything I wanted in the world. Uh, a great career as a chiropractor, um, doing well, loving what I do. I thought it was all about doing what you love, loving what you do, making a difference in other people's lives. And I was definitely living it. Uh, my name's, you know, if, you've, if you're just meeting me for the first time, I'm Dr. Nima Romani and I'm a chiropractor turned trauma therapist. I don't really like to use that word because I, I don't consider myself that, but let's say I'm a teacher, I'm a guide. Um, uh, ma mastering this concept of trauma because I realized that everybody who was coming in to see me for aches and pains was actually dealing with a stress-related disorder, was actually dealing with unresolved uh, attachment traumas. And when we don't resolve these attachment traumas, we're bonded to them. Let me say that again. When we don't resolve these attachment traumas, we're bonded to them. We become bonded to them as though because it's kind of like being born into a fishbowl with dirty water. We don't know that that's dirty. Um, see, I have a glass of water right here. I don't know if you can see. If you want to jump on Facebook Live, you can also see me there. I'm also on Clubhouse if you want to come up and ask a question later. But if you look at this here, I have a glass of water, and that is a clean glass of water. It's been filtered. Now, if I was raised all my life on water that was a little bit dirty and a little bit polluted. And every time I went and had a drink of it, as I just did there, I've habituated that that's what water tastes like. So if you were to come up to me and go, holy crap, Nemo, what the hell are you doing? You're drinking dirty water. And I say, I didn't really know it was dirty to me. It's just water. And then you gave me a clean glass of water that's filtered, I would take a sip and initially it wouldn't feel right to me, would it? It would be a little bit weird. Even though it was healthy, I would, my, my system would be a little bit suspicious of this new type of water, wouldn't it? Well, as it turns out, relationships work the same way. If you had insecure attachments with your primary caregivers, a mother or a father who was loving and meant totally well, 
but were at the effect of their own traumas, their own shame, their own cultural decencies and norms that they were trying to raise you in, their nervous systems have been conditioned a certain way to react to you in certain ways. And unconsciously, we, they are downloading all of their wounding, all of their anxieties, all of their shames unconsciously onto us, onto you. And so you're then in all likelihood, as I've done more work and worked with more people and heard more and more stories, chances are you're born into a fishbowl with dirty water. And in other words, you're bonded to this trauma thinking that that's normal. That's what love is. And so you'll have an experience where if you've felt like you had to earn that love had to be earned, that it was conditional upon certain requirements of you behaving or you having to um, uh, act a certain way or love was removed or it's the opposite that mom and dad were so not present and out to lunch so to speak or unhinged dealing with mental health issues or addictions you might have been what's called parentified so you, as a young child, didn't have a chance to be a kid. You had to take care of the emotional needs or physical needs of a parent and had to grow up really quickly. <clears throat> That's a form of trauma as well. These are little T traumas that many people don't understand. The medical system, your doctor doesn't really know about this. Most therapists who aren't trauma informed and understand attachment theory and polyvagal theory, which is not really taught in their universities as yet, it's not, they haven't caught up to it. They won't be trauma informed. And so you'll grow up thinking that it's normal for me to have to fix or rescue in order to earn love. Does that resonate with you? Let me know if that resonates with you. Well, what happens then? Well, what happens then is that in those moments, we then become bonded to that trauma. It's the fishbowl of dirty water. It's the dirty water that we're drinking that we think is normal water. <clears throat> and this, there is no fault. This is nobody's fault. I'm not here to lay blame. There's a very deep resistance to this level of deep trauma healing work is that I don't, I think it's rude. Uh, it's really being um, disrespectful to my family. Uh, I don't want to acknowledge that. Or you're on the other end of the spectrum where you're so deeply entrenched in your victim story, you can't see anything else. You can't possibly see the experience of the parent who was acting out of their own wounding. It's a really interesting dance. And this forms complex post-traumatic stress. Now you'll notice that I didn't use the term disorder. The predominant belief, let's call it that, CPTSD, the uh, complex post-traumatic stress disorder is a diagnosis that um, has been made uh, that essentially it is kind of outlining what I just said there. It's a, it's a, it's not just post-traumatic stress, one incident that just happened. This is a cluster and a series of incidents from a type of parenting that the child receives that becomes their, their identity slavery to this authoritarianism in order to belong becomes the identity. It's kind of like being in a cult in many cases, the descriptions from a lot of the students and clients in our programs. It, I literally hear, oh, it sounds like you were raised in a cult when you had a parent that was so deeply in their wound. There was a narcissistic codependent uh, cycle between mom and dad. And, you know, usually if let's say dad was the narcissist, mom was the codependent, both are really almost identically the same flipped it's kind of flip sides of a coin of one another what'll happen because mom becomes emotionally dead because she doesn't feel seen and heard in the relationship the codependent mother to a narcissistic father then becomes the narcissistic mother to the child see how this works and it's nobody's fault this is trauma dynamics 
and it's unconscious and it's very insidious and it doesn't necessarily mean physical violence and sexual abuse. That, of course, is part of it. But if you didn't have that, it doesn't mean you were not at the effect of trauma. You know, and so to acknowledge that you experience trauma doesn't necessarily mean that your parents were bad. It just means that there's an unconsciousness in society, in the collective, that doesn't understand trauma. I didn't. I didn't know this. The reason why me as a chiropractor, I'm talking to you about this is because I was super duper successful in my practice, in my work, but I just couldn't figure out this relationship dynamic issue. I would constantly, after my divorce back in 2011, I was like, uh, I, I just gave up. I ran right away. I found somebody else, you know. I realized that I was, every relationship that I was in was a trauma bond. Uh, it was a reenactment of trying to get completion with what was incomplete with my family dynamics. And that's how we do relationships. In all likelihood, if you're listening or you're watching um, this and you're in my universe, if you're in my, you kind of migrated into here or you stumbled upon here for some ungodly reason or unknown reason, uh, it's because you can relate to this. You can relate to the fact that every single relationship kind of falls into the same unfulfilling pattern. And so after one divorce and then about eight or nine failed relationships, <clears throat> I finally woke up and said, maybe there's something here, a blind spot that I wasn't able to see uh, because I keep finding partners that just don't, that I just don't feel seen and heard. I keep running into this same dynamic again and again, and it just doesn't work. It, 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 in the beginning, there's this great in, initial phase uh, where we're idealizing one another, the love bombing phase. And then within about six months to a year, once the attachment has happened and the oxytocin and dopamine chemicals of the initial kind of honeymoon phase is done, then real reality comes in. Fantasy is gone. Most of us get into relationships with people, you know, long distance stuff and we just go, oh, it's all fantasy in, our, in actuality. It's really just, it's, it's a fantasy. Um, we, we place people on these pedestals. We start idealizing one another. Uh, and what happens is um, the love bombing phase, when, when a lot of, I hear a lot of people who are still res resentful of, of their narcissistic ex and they play victim to the, the love bombing and they just love bomb me. And then, and then all the love bombing and I just can't stand the love bombing. And then what they, what they fail to realize in, in that, in that story is why was it that you were such a great, why was you, why were you so easy to manipulate with love bombing? And the answer to that is because you don't love yourself. When you are love bombed in the beginning, when you have such low self-worth because you've just been broken hearted from a, a relationship that was just ended, maybe they died, maybe you're just in some grief and you don't know how to process, or you haven't taken the time to process and you don't have a healthy relationship with your emotions, in comes in, walks in this person and they idealize you and they basically help you. What happens is it's not them that you fell in love with. You didn't fall in love with the narcissist. You fell in love with the idealized version of yourself they created in the love bombing phase. And that's really difficult for a lot of people to, uh, to swallow at the beginning because it's like, ooh. Uh, and I'm not saying, I'm, this isn't about victim blaming here. I'm really trying to empower people uh, because there's three undeniable truths that we must kind of come to terms with if we want to break from this pattern of trauma bonding and get into relationships where we feel seen and there's a mutuality and there's a mutual respect. And in the beginning, it's not them that you fall in love with. It's the validation. It's the, it, you fell in love with yourself. You fell in love with the idealized version of yourself. And if you're in a place and this isn't to shame you for that, for that at all, because I remember when I met my last relationship where things just completely fell apart, I was considering leaving chiropractic 
to teach this stuff because I found, I made a discovery, but I was I, I I didn't have the confidence to make that leap of faith into chiropractic for, out of chiropractic into teaching full time. I was doing seminars, I was getting great results with individuals, but how do you let go of a you know uh, a uh, multiple uh, six figure income that you busted your back on? going to school for eight years, 20 years in, and having your parents go, are you crazy? Having the world say, are you crazy? And getting really great results with patients and having my patients say, no, you can't leave, you can't retire. And so it was really difficult. I didn't think that I had the confidence. And so I had very low self-worth at that time. And in walks in this person who uh, I was able to help. She uh, reached out to me. She was checking out my content and she was also a, a student of John Martini's. And she says, I wonder what you've done with John's work. And I sat down and this is my superpower. My superpower is being able to see through people to be able to help them see what's in their blind spot. Now, it doesn't mean everybody's ready to hear it. I've realized most people don't want to hear it. So now I'm, I've become very choosy and boundaried with those people who I sit down with and I help. They're the ones who really are, are keen on, on dismantling this. But I realize most people aren't, but she was. And she said, I really could use your help. And within 45 minutes, I was at her cafe. I helped zone in on the exact wound that was tied into her um her food sensitivities. She built a gluten-free, dairy-free cafe because her nervous system could not handle it uh, and she couldn't eat properly. There was no place, so she built a cafe and a, a community of people that just loved her. She was a pillar of the community. And here she is. I'm at her cafe having breakfast and she says, could you could you help, help me with this? I, I, I can't eat, uh, my, I'm weak. My health is turned to shit. And I, I shared with her my discovery as a chiropractor. And what led me into this work is that there's a direct correlation between our health and unresolved attachment traumas. So I helped her <clears throat> piece together this one attachment wound with her that was tied to her food sensitivity. And within 45 minutes, I said, I had her in tears of gratitude for and an embodied sense of love and safety towards the person towards herself that she was really judging uh and all of a sudden i said are you do you think you're ready to eat some gluten right now she goes okay yeah i don't feel scared i go across the street because there was nothing gluten there was no gluten in her cafe i had to go across the street to like a starbucks and i got a piece of banana banana loaf or banana bread came back and I said, here, eat this. She eats it <clears throat> within about, and then I asked her, I said, how long do you expect after eating something like this, like this for, you to, for you to get a reaction? And she goes, within an hour, I should be like extremely uncomfortable and wanting to go to the hospital. I said, all right, let's wait. So we sat there and we fucking waited. <laughs> I was just like, all right, I wanna see this. This was at a time where I was not fully sure, should I stay or go from my career as a chiropractor? Because I've made a discovery, this is badass. What I've discovered is pretty badass. And there's, there's nobody talking about it. There's nobody really talking about it on, on a scale that, that, that makes it coherent and makes sense and gives people a path so that they can heal. And so within an hour, there was no reaction. I was like, holy shit. So I went home that night and then I texted her in the evening and I said, hey, how you feeling? She goes, I can't believe this. This is so crazy. And the next day she messages me and says, I didn't have any reaction. And then she goes, I now have another memory that I have with dairy where my father was force feeding me milk when I was a, ch a child. Could we work on that one? And I said, sure, but you just come to my office. So she comes to my office and I helped her 
shift that with dairy. And then right after that session, I walk, we walked to the Indi- my, my favorite Indian restaurant in the whole world. If you ever go, it's in Maple Ridge, British Columbia. It's called GM Restaurant. Make sure you go. Say hi to, uh, uh, say hi to Swaranjit for me. Uh, I went for 20 years. I was going there for, for Indian food. I would go at least two twice a week. Um, they, ha- they make their own cheesecakes. But anyway, I brought her there and we had butter chicken and cheesecake. And I sat there and waited. And later that day when she messaged me, she goes, I feel a little bit not great, but there's no way that I would have been able to eat that before we did this. And so what she did for me was she gave me confidence she gave me absolute confidence and she started pedestalizing my work. She's like, this is the best thing. I want to support you. So she started, she started idealizing me and my work and giving me confidence at a time that I didn't have the confidence. If it wasn't for her and the confidence she gave me, because I didn't have it in myself yet, I was only just brand new. I wouldn't have had the courage to jump ship from chiropractic and take that big leap. So for that, I'm, I'm, I'm hugely grateful to her. But what was, but why I was an incredible um, target was because I didn't have confidence in myself. At the time, I wasn't physically attracted to her, but she gave me confidence. So what is it that the narcissist that was me in the in the in the relationship both of us were she was a covert narcissist mine i was more of the overt type at the time and uh sex services and supply how to know you know what when in these trauma bonded relationships people become transactional it's have you ever felt kind of a transactional relationship um it's sex services and supply. So what I got from her was definitely sex and services, services. She was helping me with my business. She actually, she believed in me so much. She set up all of these, um, uh, talks for me in her cafe, introduced more people to my work and shared her story. Like, are you kidding me? Like, wow. She set herself up like that. And then eventually we would, you know, have sex too. And, Next thing you know, every other girl that I was dating and I was, you know, dating another person at the time, she was married at the time to a woman. There was no, it was just friendship. But what happened was she saw an opportunity with me. She saw that I was going to be her window to leaving that cafe, which was actually going downhill. And she was also a a former sex worker. And she was, she had an online kind of company where she was exploiting women and she was a madam and she was, that was kind of on the DL. She wasn't kind of public about it, but she wanted out of that life and she saw an opportunity and I became very susceptible because I didn't have confidence and and I got my sex, my, my services she was helping me with my business and my supply. She was validating my work. So why I'm sharing that with you is when you are judging the other person for love bombing, it's wise for us to look and see why we were the perfect um, match at the time. What in myself was incomplete that had me very susceptible to, to being kind of taken, right? To being exploited. And so we were both exploiting one another. She was exploiting me to get her out of her kind of that dark world. And also she, she saw that I could probably help her. She, um, when I look back on her, uh, I definitely had, uh, narcissistic traits. She definitely literally fits all the categories of the borderline personality, what what you would consider borderline personality disorder. I didn't know what that was at the time. I ain't saying she a gold digger. Fill in, fill in the rest. Um, but essentially that's what happened. And so I was in a trauma bond with this dynamic for four years and it took the police having to be uh, involved for this wake up call to happen for me to go inside 
and learn about all this stuff, learn about my shadows, learn about attachment theory, learn about the polyvagal theory. I actually then quit chiropractic and now went all in when I discovered this to becoming a trauma therapist. And I'm in my second year of somatic experiencing training um, with my good friend, Dr. Russell Kennedy and uh, Dr. Uh, and Mark Kerr, who's a counselor. And we're just three guys just made a discovery about somatic work and we really want to help people get to the root cause. And so the biggest question that keeps coming up in this in this thing is why do we keep attracting partners that can't see us? And the answer to that question was the same answer for my question. I kept attracting that because I didn't have the capacity to see myself because I was bonded to that trauma dynamic with my parent growing up. And so our work is to transform this trauma bond so that when you do, I just, just sharing, I just came from a, a, a beautiful bike ride. If you, um, I'll post it on my Instagram around, uh, Stanley park around the seawall in Vancouver, uh, with my amazing wife and son. And I'm 46 years old and I truthfully at the age of 43 was convinced that that was going to be impossible for me because I was never able to have a relationship that wasn't based on a trauma bond where she where she was using me for something and wasn't and I was using her it was basically a transaction it was like what can I get from this person that's how we do relationships now we're like we're consumers what is this person going to give me you know, from the narcissistic side, it's sex, services, and supply. From the borderline side or the codependent side, it's safety and security. So it's like we got to manipulate. We become, we put on these masks. We all show up in relationships, um, rescuing one another, putting on these masks and playing these roles so that we can get our needs met. And no wonder my relationships weren't working before then. And so it took a lot of work. It took a lot of tears. Uh, and, uh, I certainly didn't do it alone, but I wanted to share with you three, um, undeniable, uh, truths, three undeniable, uh, requirements that you must do, you must get to in order to, uh, break these trauma bonds. So the first one I'm going to write down and I have a little, uh, iPad here for those of you on, um, clubhouse, you can go into my Facebook group and you can watch this live and it'll be on YouTube soon when my team puts it up my youtube channel came back yay the first one here is we in order to break these trauma bonds so that we can now finally create relationships where we're finally being seen we must learn how to integrate our victim story let me let me write that again integrate victim story and I'll explain to you what that means. Integrate victim story. What do I mean by that? What I mean by that is when we get hurt in a past relationship, there's a psychological phenomenon that occurs. It's called splitting. Look it up. Our ego wants to defend ourselves, our ego feels, our ego, which is there to protect the wounded parts of us, starts to show up and create a narrative to protect us from shame, really, to protect us from guilt and to protect us from shame. So what'll happen, uh, let me give you an example of how this would work. You and I are in a relationship and I... I'm late, let's say I'm late constantly in my meetings with you. If I haven't really looked at and worked on and had a capability of feeling my embarrassment and shame and being able to sit with those uncomfortable emotions because I've checked out and left, after, I, after I've stood you up or I'm late for let's say the third time, that shame overrides my body, like it overtakes my body. And in order for me to avoid feeling it, I'll do a few things. Thing number one, I'll just ghost you. I just can't handle the shame of seeing you disappointed again, the guilt and the shame. So I just won't show up. That's one reason. 
oftentimes I, people would ghost, I would feel ghosted. And I was like, oh my gosh, like, what did I do? It was me until I learned about trauma and realized if you're not able to sense and feel and perceive and sit with feelings of shame, which most people aren't, if you haven't done inner work, I don't expect you to be. Most people don't. Definitely if you're Persian, you haven't. <laughs> Persians can't do this very well. Abirurizi, they have a word called Abirurizi, which is, uh, it's, just, it's just like completely destroying my character type of thing. My, my, it's shameful. So they, don't, they can't handle it. So um, they'll either go, you'll, you'll, you'll be ghosted. The other thing that I might do if I feel that guilt and I sit there, um, my ego will then turn around and go and then get angry with you. And then I'll say, why the hell are you trying to shame me? You'll, you'll express, you'll say, hey, Nima, this is the third time you're late. And then because I can't handle that shame, all my ego defenses will come up and then I'll point the finger and go, why are you being such a dick? It's you. What about you that does it? And that's the ego defense. Does that make sense? So. This ego is a protective mechanism that we can't feel our shame. Once a relationship ends, there's a part of us that feels incredibly ashamed. We blame ourselves. Does this resonate? You blame yourself. You beat yourself up. It's called ego dystony, ego dystonic. Okay. It's very harmful to our self image. In other words, that's another word for it. It's really a threat to our self image. And because we can't handle that threat to our self image, the ego comes up with a solution. It creates this protective narrative. And the narrative is that person is evil. That person's a fucking monster. That person is the devil. And I, I'm going to say something, just giving you a little bit of warning that this might conflict you or confront you. This is the first defense strategy of the narcissist. Let me say that again. This is, the, this is an ego defense strategy, a narcissistic defense strategy. It's, they call it external locus of control. It's all their fault. I'm blameless. It's that person's fault. Now, that victim story is very helpful for, to prevent us from feeling that shame. The problem is you can't have a victim story one year, two years, five years, six years down the road, still calling yourself a survivor and expect to feel healthy. You're, you you got to pick one or the other. This was a mind blowing revelation for me when I was working as a chiropractor, which meant led me to want to leave realizing not everybody wants to heal. Everybody consciously wants to heal, but unconsciously it would actually mean letting go of your victim story. And if you, if you let go of that victim story, what would that mean? It would mean I'm responsible. Oh, I can't have that. I'd rather be sick. <laughs> this is the unconscious dance of the shadow. This is why I left chiropractic because I saw these, these shenanigans going on with people and they weren't even aware. And it was making me pissed off being in a clinic working with these people. And I was just like, fuck it. I don't care if I'm making, you know, six figure salary, uh, doing this. I, I, I can't do it anymore. Like I can't spend the, the remaining 30, 40 years of my career talking to people who don't understand that there's the, these unconscious motives going on. And Carl Jung was the one that said, until we make the unconscious conscious, it will rule your life and you'll call it fate. So you must learn how to integrate that victim story. Am I going to say that it's easy? No, there's two types of people. Those that completely deny their victim story and they say, oh, I understand my parents, they did the best that they could. It's all good. I, I don't have a victim. Like, it's all good. I don't really want to focus and talk bad about them. That's type one where you're completely bypassing your victim story. I'm not saying to do that either. It's important for you to acknowledge the harm and the pain that you went through and to really hold a container and feel seen and heard in that. It is super important that that happens. The problem is if you're not careful and you're getting support with the wrong type of people, support workers, therapists, counselors, people, or coaches uh, in the space that 
you know, are survivors and trauma survivors and they are like are talking out of their wounds rather than their scars, then they'll then you'll get stuck there. You'll get stuck in that victim story and you won't get out. And so there's no way you can heal from your trauma bond because what will happen is that victim story stays with you. Guess what happens when you go on a date? What are you going to talk about? You're going to talk about what a fucking narcissist your ex was and how you're such a victim and you're going to attract a rescuer because a healthy person would look at that and go, mm, sorry, listen, you work on your shit. I'll see you when you're healthy. That's what a healthy, secure individual would do. When you're on a date with a healthy and secure individual and you're barking out your victim story and talking about what a monster your ex was, the healthy, secure person would be like, great, I really wish you well on your recovery because they will want no part in that. However, a rescuer would salivate. That was me, by the way. When, she, when I was dating my ex, she was nonstop going into her victim story, nonstop. I didn't even, but me, I, because I wasn't fully healthy, I was like, hmm, this is a way for me to be important. I can fix her. I have the tools because I myself wasn't secure. I thought, oh, I can become really important. Something I want to tell you is that if you are dating a rescuer, if you're rescuing someone, if you're dating a rescuer, you're looking at somebody who's rescuing you, you're now looking at your next perpetrator. And by perpetrator, I mean, I don't mean physically abusive only. I mean, they'll leave. They'll perpetrate you by leaving. So if you are a damsel in distress or a dude in distress looking for a mommy to rescue you, which is unconsciously what we're doing when we haven't integrated our victim story, this person who's rescuing you within the next six months to a couple of years will eventually become your next perpetrator. On the flip side, if you're the rescuer type and you're dating someone with alcohol issues and heroin issues and saying, I'll fix them, I'll be the one to rescue them, that's your narcissistic part speaking. That's your grandiose hero, heroic narcissistic part, which I also can relate to, believe me. The unfortunate thing is you're gonna be their next perpetrator. It's a trauma bond. To have a secure relationship, you must integrate that victim story internally. You must give it space, not bypass it, but not fucking live in it. It's a dance and it's a very, very, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It's a very heavily nuanced. Most people that I speak to or DM me, they're heavy into one or heavy into the other. There's a, a happy medium that needs to happen and that's why I call it integration. So that's the first thing you need to do we need to do, we all need to do what I had to do in order to transform my trauma bond and then find an amazing partner who I have every effort, I make every effort to understand and see. And she does the same for me. And it's like, it's like before it felt like I could go to work and I had a tough time at work, but I could come into my relationship and then feel, ah, uh, I can breathe and I feel like I can recharge in the relationship. Before doing this work, the relationship was more work for me than work. So I would come home from work and then the real work would begin and it was just fucking exhausting. So I want you to not have to burn out your adrenals. I want you to really feel safe in relationships. I want you to win. So integrating your victim story is the first part. The second thing we gotta do is we gotta learn how to cultivate self-trust. Cultivate self-trust. Cultivating self-trust. Now, a lot of times people will, what people will say is, I, I don't trust anymore. I'm never going to get into a relationship. I don't trust. Well, that makes sense because you feel betrayed. You feel abandoned. And so you're wanting to protect yourself by never getting into a relationship again. And I see you. That was me. I was like, I don't think... I remember going, I, I can't do, I remember feeling that fed up. I remember after it was done, I was in so much pain. I was like, I don't trust women. I had already gone through a divorce and lost all, like most of my assets. Then now I've just ended this trauma bond. And I was like, like, I'm going to do something that I just never, ever, ever, ever 
thought to do since I was like 17 years old. And that's to not have to be with somebody and have a partner validating me, a woman validating my worth. That was terrifying to me. Here I am successful in my practice, uh, accomplished in a career, but I just couldn't even stand the thought of not having a woman in my life telling me that I'm wonderful every day. Like I had such low a sense of self-worth at the time. And I realized it was because I didn't trust myself. And the, the, the second thing that I had to do to break that cycle of trauma bonding was to cultivate self-trust. Um, because I get a lot of questions from people saying, how do I cultivate self? How do I, how do I trust again? I don't trust people. I can't trust again. I, I don't even trust you. I don't even want to sign up to your program because I don't even trust you. You remind me of my ex. I'm like, yeah, I know. <laughs> Get in line. I've heard that a lot. Um, <laughs> but here's the thing I want you to understand is that when I trust myself, when I fully trust myself and I've developed this bond and relationship with myself through my nervous system, that's how I, that's kind of like the secret that I have, secret sauce that I give that, most people uh, aren't aware of is you cultivate self-trust through your nervous system, through an understanding and mastery of your nervous system. Because when I trust myself, it doesn't matter if I'm with somebody who's not trustworthy because I'll be able to tune in and then speak up for myself because I trust myself. So people are, uh, if you're sitting here waiting to meet somebody who's trustworthy, my suggestion is to start with you. Because if you don't, you're always going to be looking over your shoulders. This person trustworthy? Is they, are they trustworthy? When I trust myself, it doesn't matter if the other person's trustworthy or not. In fact, I assume, I actually assume, uh, this is one of the questions one of my students was saying is, I, I just feel like everyone's full of shit. How do I trust people? And I told them, I said, I trust that people are at the effect of their wounds and they're saying things and they're talking and speaking just to get their needs met. I just trust that that's happening. I trust that most people are unconscious. I trust that when people say something to me, I go based on what their physiology, what their behavior says. I don't trust what people say. I'll listen. But then after doing trauma work, I now observe your body language. We, I, this happened on a webinar last night. This woman was like, I, that's it. I'm ready. I'm ready to do the work. And then she had a lot of exclamation marks. And I was like, yeah, I've heard that before. It's big, especially with codependents. Codependents who are fawners and pleasers, you'll say, I'm ready and you'll do it. You'll say, I'm ready to do this. But then when it comes time, your body goes into a freeze. So I trust that you're at the effect of your attachment traumas. And I trust that they're more powerful than what you say. <laughs> so it's not that I don't trust you. I just trust your trauma bonds a lot more than I trust what you'll say. That's just, it's just a way better way of approaching the world for me. That way I don't feel disappointed that you betrayed my trust. I just know that unconsciously, whatever we say is one thing. Oh, I'm committed. Yeah. Let's see that. Let's see if you're committed. Your behavior will let me know. So I trust myself. And after I trust myself, I trust that by observing your behavior, I trust my own intuition about it rather than what you say. Does that make sense? When you get to that level of cultivating of self-trust, you're not scared of people anymore. You're not scared of getting hurt because you don't put unrealistic expectations on human beings who are at the effect unconsciously of their trauma anymore. You understand, you develop understanding. Instead of trying to cultivate forgiveness, you can upgrade forgiveness towards understanding. Wouldn't you rather be understood than forgiven? I would. So when you really get this right, you cultivate that self-trust, you develop a sense of understanding. And the third last piece uh, of how to dismantle trauma bonds so that you can attract partners that, that can see you. The third part, and I, 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 I'm just sharing with you my journey, is to get help. 
if you if you think that you can just do this alone if you think that you can re- see yourself and your blind spots by just watching this youtube video or this facebook live or showing up in these rooms uh, and listening and think that that's going to do it for you that's a bit of a fantasy that's a bit of an illusion shadow work our unconscious is in our bodies and it takes somebody who's very skilled at observing you, not listening to what you say once a week, but observing you and working with you and pointing out your unconscious habits so that you can change the dance. We can't do this alone. And if you think that you can do this by yourself, how long do you think that it's going to take for you to really figure things out? It, it'll take years. And so the, the one thing on our, um, the most precious asset I've discovered, and this is really, I really got a felt sense of this since I had a kid. Dominic is now 18 months in the recording of this video. Like, holy shit. Holy shit, does it ever go by fast. Diana and I were looking and scrolling through pictures from like a year ago, and he was so small, and I was like, oh my God. He's so small, he's so perfect, he's so cute. He just grows up so fast. Where does all the time go? Time is your most precious asset. We're all going to die someday. To think that you can just read a book and figure out how to dismantle all of these unconscious complexes is a, is a, is a fantasy. So my invitation for you to, is to get help that's beyond talk therapy once a week because talk therapy doesn't address the trauma bond itself, doesn't change you to, doesn't, doesn't train you and teach you how to help yourself dismantle your distress responses of fight, flight, freeze, fawn. Those are what you want transformation. The the tendency for you to just run as soon as you get triggered. That doesn't change by talking about it on a weekly call, on a weekly session, and just repeating your story. It involves getting into the nervous system and to release that stored stress, that distress kind of chemicals from these unresolved attachments from the fishbowl of dirty water that you were born into. You got to become a neuroscientist, a behavioral expert, and a sociologist all in one within yourself. You got to become your own medicine. You cannot expect somebody else to do it for you. So getting guidance is necessary, but It's you that's doing the work. So instead of finding a person, a hero or a guru to save you, find a community. The community is the guru and learn how to become your own rescuer. So those are the three things that I really wanted to to share. Integrate your victim story, cultivate self-trust and make sure you get a guide and a community to help you. Otherwise, you're spinning your wheels going years down the road, what would it be like for you if the next two years you were in the same situation, dating the same type of person with a different haircut past two more years? uh, What would that cost you? What would that be like? I mean, our health is at stake. I know that just by doing this work, my, my health, my energy, my anxiety levels have gone down. Um, this feeling of safety in the world has changed, even though life has gotten crazy over the last couple of years, I feel more grounded and more, um, positive about myself, my family in the future through this crisis, thanks to this work. And I really love sharing it with people. Um, I want to give an opportunity for anybody who really would love to come in and, um, um, uh, to ask any questions. This would be a great opportunity um, yeah, this would be a great opportunity for anybody who really wanted to jump on the call and, um, ask my, ask me a question, put your hand up, come on up and, uh, let me help guide you. If you have any specific questions, it's interesting. I just had a, a session on asking questions to help you get what you want. And so this would be a good practice for anybody who really wanted some guidance on this topic and, Maybe even just to jump on and share what uh, what came up for you or a question you had or uh, a story you wanted to share. I'd love to hear. 
I see a bunch of people in our uh, clubhouse chat. I'd love to love to hear it if you if you're you feel okay enough to come up and ask. Anybody? Anybody? I see a little comment from Ma- Myla Vega. If you wanted to, if you wanted to come up and ask. Would be a great time. Oh, I have one question here. Jana, Jan Wallace. Oh, Jan. Okay, Jan. I, uh, you're quite a character in the Trigger Proof group. Uh, sharing. You got a lot of great enthusiasm. Uh, do you have a question you'd love to ask? Yeah. Um, in the offers that yourself or your great colleague, um, Russ Kennedy, would offer us to Groove Biz Audience, slash clients um and i can see by the ability to make such offer within what it is that you do if you could tell people about the way that they could practice slash having lab of getting better self referencing to have relationship with people um, and start to practice that. I mean, if you don't have the skill set and and literally the cellular imprint yet, mm-hmm. where are you supposed to get it if it's not in such as what you guys would offer? Is it that you do? Yeah, that's exactly what uh, in our programs, I kind of in a slow dripping way, teach people how to change, you know, the, the perceptions about themselves, the expectations on themselves and others, and learn how to get into the body and release pain that we store because we haven't really, uh, had the training in being able to just drop in and feel it. And so uh, in the offers that I have, that that we have in our programs, uh, in my programs, definitely that's part of the training itself. Um, 100%, the biggest gap in the education is it's not knowing the content, it's actually getting in and implementing it. How to feel, how to, how to uh, learn how to alchemize and metabolize guilt how to metabolize shame, how to take the shame that we've been carrying in our bodies about ourselves and how to think about it differently and then how to move that energy through our body so that we can actually feel a, a, a difference when we wake up and walk through the streets. And so uh, there's there's training for that and that's exactly what, what we offer. Absolutely. That's wonderful. And- um, I'm, I'm really not only glad to know that, but that you do is a huge advantage over those that are just. Yeah, there's there's offering. different. Ty- yeah, yeah, there's different types of stuff like you can go on YouTube and then have people say, all right, here's what you do. Step one, step two and step three. And then you go home and then you practice it. and You don't know how to do it. But it's really powerful when we as a community in a container kind of like in a safe place to actually feel stuff, we practice the art of actually dropping in and going into the body and then noticing all of the great resistances that will come up in this process. Because it's really hard, Jen. Ever since you were a child, you've likely been avoiding feelings or trying to cope and get your needs met by avoiding feelings or having kind of like a false self or ego defense mechanisms up and you can't see it. So to watch it on a video versus showing up and learning and discussing it with people and going through neural exercises, which get you specifically into your body and practicing learning how to ask questions into your body to find answers and cultivating that relationship between you and your younger parts in your body. That's a Mm. skill. That's going to take practice. That's like martial arts. It's the difference between you reading a book on karate versus you registering, showing up to a class, practicing your punches and kicks and having someone go up, Try to twist your wrist a little bit this way and that way. So it's a it's night and day difference actually showing up and doing the work, which is versus just being on, you know, a clubhouse chat and listening. It's com- two completely different things. Yeah, it, it it genuinely is. I didn't realize 
Um, and I'm really trying to make a long story short as to not tie up other people come. Anybody else who's got a question, um, go ahead and put your hand up for right after Jen. I'd love to hear from you. Uh, but yeah, go ahead. What's your, um, what's your, your um, question? I, I, I went to a learning situation where the person helped us with, um, getting reset, um, with embodiment identification Okay, cool. And walk through that for a number of years, though what I couldn't get out of the program as wonderful as it was helping me to get deconditioned of collapsing uh-huh. was there's just there was just barely any lab by with which to work back and forth with each other, except for the class times of yeah. the day. Yeah. If you had a partner, you could work these things out, but mm-hmm. I didn't and really didn't have friends that were at this same, I want to do the same thing for myself. And so, cool. yeah, I went there and I got a lot of it via a file in my embodiment, but just about nobody to practice it with. Right. And just because I'm not in a relationship doesn't mean I don't want to be working those things out with people. Right. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's Hello. important. Uh, it's very important for you to, um, really find a community where this can, where you can actually practice and ask questions and make requests and, and, um, ask for, ask for what you need. So thank you so much for sharing that, Jen. I appreciate that. Panya, welcome. You have a question. Hi, Dr. Nima. Uh, yeah, I do have a question. It's a two part question. So I'll go ahead with the first part. So sure. I have realized that I do play damsel in distress and I have been continuing my victim story. Yep. So You're not alone in the that. Question, <laughs> the question I had was, uh, so the last uh, few years I have been dating guys and in every story I have seen myself while I am friends with them. I play as a victim. Yeah. Once I am uh, involved with them romantically, somehow like, both of them said uh, they felt uh, started they started feeling inferior uh, i don't know they said that i portray myself as superior mm-hmm. i am too much or they feel too little or their ego or i'm too talented and all but then that i don't understand how is that switch happening i was same person before the relationship started and even after okay so it sounds like you're um you get into these patterns where you play the victim and yeah. then the feedback you're getting from them is that you put yourself on a pedestal above them. Yes. Okay. But I believe somehow it's an ego response. I have, yeah. as you mentioned, Yeah. I wasn't sure about it. Totally. I, first I wanted to acknowledge the courage it takes for you to get up on stage and admit that that's that shows me that there is a true commitment to healing because most of the ego defenses we feel so ashamed we're not going to admit something like that so i my respect for people who who show up and actually uh, courageously um call themselves forward like that though i call those people badasses so i just wanted to say that's pretty awesome that you did that um <clears throat> Do you mind me um, just sharing with you what my intuition says? And if if I'm wrong, please, please, please correct me because we deal with trauma and permission is very important because your ego might come up and say, fuck you, Nima. (laughs) And so I just wanted to give, I just wanted to give, uh, get some permission. And so I I always listen to people uh, and I, I'm not saying I, I, it's prejudice, but I'm Persian and I listen and I, I hear a kind of a Middle Eastern, uh, Asian, South Asian background. And, uh, immediately I know, uh, that there is kind of like a narcissistic parenting style culture that's culturally based. Anybody who comes up, who's Asian, Persian, um, uh, East Indian, uh, I will know for a fact what they're, what, what they're traumas are because I know I, I've studied the culture. I've, I, I travel. I know the people. I have friends in these cultures. I'm also a big fan of Russell Peters. Somebody going to get a hurt real bad. So um, we, 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 we don't talk about it in terms of racism. We talk about it in a playful, fun kind of thing in our community. So I know that that, that victim story, that victimhood that you keep kind of um, 
reverting back to is is our ego's way of establishing uh, some sort of meaning, some sort of purpose, some sort of grandiosity. It's a it's a it's a grasping of power when we feel powerless. And if you have this unconscious sense of powerlessness that you will that you are living with, then whether you're aware of it or not, you will create a false grandiose self and you'll start talking about all the shit that you're amazing at and 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 brag about certain things and portray a grandiose self, <clears throat> not knowing that it's a defense strategy against your the, the fact that you haven't integrated your pathetic, weak, insignificant parts to, to, of you, which we all share as a collective. Does that make sense at all? Is that landing at all for you so far? Yeah, it does. I am resonating with it so hard. Okay. Does it embarrass you a little bit? Are you feeling a little like you want to vomit? Uh, no, I don't feel embarrassed. Okay. I just feel that it came to the surface. Okay, perfect. A lot of people say, I feel like throwing up. I get that a lot. <laughs> I get that a lot on my webinars and my trainings or our group trainings. People are like, I feel like I want to vomit. And that's a good sign. That is part of shadow integration. Ideally, you will sign up to just want to vomit it all out because that's telling you that there's an unconscious a blind spot that's now come to the awareness. If we can't see it, it's possessing us. So yeah, there's a, a pathetic, weak, insignificant little part of us that you have as well, that I have as well, we all have it, that because you're not okay with it, you, you've, you've abandoned it, you're going to try to get your needs, those needs met through putting up a false self, putting up a mask. And that's how most of the time people, without doing their healing work, you'll have relationships that are based on this, these uh, inauthentic um, false self projections. And here's the best part, you'll attract somebody equally. You will attract somebody to the same level of emotional maturity who's putting up an equal false self uh, as you are. And so... That's, it sounds like you've kind of fit that description of the fact that, you know, this is why we, we keep falling into these same patterns. And I really admire the fact that you had feedback from two guys, the first guy who said it to you, you, you could basically maybe brush it off. But after hearing the second guy say it to you, and you're getting that feedback a second time, it's a good idea for you to kind of wake up and go, all right, maybe there's something for me to grow from, even though it hurts. Even though my ego's taken a hit, um, what do I want in this life? I want to have a relationship where I can be my authentic self. Okay, well, what do I got to do? What does Panya got to do? Well, I got to work on finding those really weak, insignificant, shameful parts, weak and pathetic parts that I feel like I need to advocate for by playing the victim. And I'm going to, and getting outside rescuers as playing this damsel in distress, it's time for me to learn how to rescue those parts. Does that make sense? It does. It does. I, I have no idea, you know, how to even you know, process all of this. Yeah, process. I know. It's a lot. Came hey? to the surface. Yeah. I know. It's a lot, but it's, uh, it's important. And you're not alone. Um, definitely join my Facebook community, Trigger Proof. Uh, we actually have this weekend, my suggestion to you, where do you live, Panya? Uh, in India. Okay, you're in India. So if you don't mind, Saturday night, really, if you're really, it sounds like you're, you're pretty, you're very intelligent. That's one thing. You have intelligence. Um, you have humility, which is really important in healing our traumas. Um, humility is the most important thing, um, and, and a commitment, a, a, a real deep desire to heal, I would suggest you join us at our overview experience this weekend. If you really want to learn the tools and start to unpack this and master that, um, that's a great place to start. Um, it would be this weekend. It's on, it's a link in my bio on Instagram. Um, if it okay. interests you, definitely join us. Okay, thank you. I would, I would, I surely would. And thank you for the answer you gave. You bet. Hopefully that was helpful. Do you feel complete with that, Panya? It was helpful. And I'm going to take some time to process all of it. <laughs> all right, my dear. But thank take you. Take good care. Bye. Nicole, you're back. 
<laughs> good evening. Good, good evening, Jackson. Good yeah. afternoon here, but good evening over oh, there yes. in the UK. Oh, no. It's, yeah, we've watched the sunset already. So, <clears throat> um, well, thank you very much um, for inviting me up to speak. Or, uh, you bet. And allow me to put my hands up. Yeah. Um, I'm having a little bit of a the pennies dropping with something with me just now. So I wondered if I could share that with you. And sure. Maybe see your take on it. Thank yeah. you. Um, and let me know if you have a question to... too. Yes, um, it's about worth. Mm -hmm. um, the question is about worth, how mm -hmm. that connects to when you spoke about your story about not having the confidence at that time so that you, um, when you were starting out. Yes, well, you yeah, when I, did, trauma. when I didn't have yeah. confidence, uh, mm. when I was making the leap from chiropractic to teaching. Yeah, I, did, I didn't have confidence in myself at the time. Yeah. Please may you talk a bit about how that connects to um, self-worth and if <clears> I <throat> can sort of contextualize that with where I'm coming at with that is. Um, self-worth. Self-worth. Uh, self-worth self and confidence. Um, self-worth as in one of the reasons that brought me to your work mm -hmm. and that is going on in the background for me. Mm hmm is trying to heal my relationship with money. Right. Good one. Um, and I've taken money and trauma. Um, yes, exactly. Everyone's and got it. Being <laughs> Everyone's got that. Ki kind of addicted to poverty. Yes. Yeah. 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 And very, tonight. very, very good awareness. I just love you. I just love that you said that. <laughs> that takes a lot of courage to say, to own that. You know what? I'm addicted to poverty. I'm addicted to that there unconsciously I am, mm -hmm. you know, like <clears throat> this would be a really great, um, a really great test. Imagine somebody walked up to you. This is like everybody's fantasy come true. A briefcase full of cash, about 1 million pounds of cash. Mm -hmm. You're in the UK. So I use pounds, uh, 1 million pounds of cash. And you have this unconscious bond to poverty. I don't want to use the term addiction. Uh, I'll use the term mm -hmm. bond. You're trauma bonded to poverty. It's the fishbowl that you were born into. And let's say you were, you were born into that and you were in, in your family dynamics and you heard your father swearing at the television at, at, against rich people. Rich people are the devil or your mother judging or, or, or you saw somebody in your family dynamic make a lot of money and all of a sudden, everybody started judging them and ostracizing them. Well, guess what you're going to do in order to be loved and belong? You're going to keep yourself poor unconsciously. So yeah. we're bonded to our trauma with money, with sex, with whatever. Yeah. It's whatever yeah. it is. That's why our trauma work is imperative if we want, if we want to have a really fulfilling experience with life. So <clears throat> the first step is just really recognizing that recognizing yeah. what what okay. value you're getting out of staying at that level that you're in what value you're getting are you getting certainty and familiarity yes mm -hmm. are you yeah. getting a little sense of adventure like like a challenge oh like do you do, this is what i saw when i did my trauma work with money i started noticing that um Every month I would go through the same cycle of, oh my God, oh my gosh, my business, I gotta, I have to make a certain amount to stay afloat. And so it became this like, this adventure to, to just, whoosh, and then at the end I could throw my hands up in the air and go, yay, I won another month exhausting myself in this cycle only <laughs> to start it over all again the next month. Does that resonate with you? Yeah, it does. Okay. And it connects. Yeah, so totally here's what I did. Too. Here's what I yeah. did, Nicole. So yeah. I basically yeah. acknowledged mm -hmm. that I was getting a little kinky high out of that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> kind of like on our first call and <laughs> when we were talking about shame, to break the trauma bonds, we must acknowledge the unconscious parts of us that actually we get a real high out of that. And, and we got to join those parts with compassion. And once you join those parts with compassion, you can then teach over time and with the right guidance, because you can see how important it is to have guidance and, and coaching mm -hmm. on this, 
to be able to then create a different dance, to change the step in the dance, to say, you know what? I can get my sense of adventure in building my business and and, and really going for that business opportunity that I'm working towards or that other, like I can find different ways to create these familiarity and certainty and, and sense of adventure and, 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 and connection. This is the other thing that I was doing. I was finding is it was giving me connection, this little dance of poverty every month that I would go through cyclically. I could always look and go, I could complain to my team and then feel significant and feel important. And just really with compassion, finding those younger parts of me that were using this little dance to get those needs met. And if I didn't, as a functional adult, find other strategies to find ways of getting those needs met, I would always come up with the same poverty consciousness to do it. So this is the difference. This is individuating from that fishbowl of dirty water and becoming a a fully functional, healed self. That's your journey, Nicole. And I'm so grateful that I'm a part of it. Oh, thank you. And and there's something that you said there. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, my phone is doing something weird. It's all good. That's, is the sound okay? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, perfect. The thing that you said there, Nima, was c- calling yourself out on the the bit that's getting out off on not having the money. Yeah, and that's exactly the bit that's pinged up for me tonight. Right. Is, um, on a different clubhouse room, which um, your good friend Dr. Russ, Russ Kennedy yep. started which is about the money doctors. Yeah. I was just having a, a conversation with Dr. Roger on there about, and he was saying, but you're worth more than this. And that was like, oh, it hit exactly the same place mm-hmm. as shame. Yeah. And I thought, well, is that the reason why? Yeah. The I yes. Would choose the, the, what, the, the, the younger I'm parts choosing of choosing the right partner r- because I'm choosing somebody that will, drain my resources right and bring you back and validate your unconscious story that you're worth nothing yes so no matter how much people it's exactly it no matter it's not about how much you make because no matter how much like you could win the lotto and within six months you'll go back to your set point of what you feel you deserve so instead of working on money, it's wiser for us to heal the trauma parts, tra- trauma, uh, the, the parts of us that don't feel worthy of receiving. And mm. with, 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 with good reason, this is kind of like our next week's training in the Cycle Breakers portal, because that's what I'm going to be talking about. So I can't wait to share it with you. But that's why if you want to have a healthy relationship, if you want to have abundance, Instead of looking out there and going, why is there a narcissist? Why does not my boss not pay me more? Why does the government not raise the minimum wage? It's wiser for us to address the younger parts of us that feel that we don't deserve more. Yes, not all of us feels we don't. There's parts of you that's like, fuck this. I deserve more. I agree. But there's, there's an opposing part within us. We're not one self. Nicole, you're not a one individual person. <laughs> you're looking at Nima. You're not looking at Nima as a solitary individual self. I have many selves. We all have multiple personalities, in case you haven't noticed. <laughs> you know, we all have them. Mm-hmm. We just haven't cultivated the skill of bringing all of them home, individuating and really integrating them all. And that's trauma healing work. And so you're on the right path as you go along oh, with it. Every yeah. single one of the clients we've worked with, I, I still get DMs from there like, Honestly, since I took your course, I'm making more money than ever. And the thing is, we never talked about money. We don't do business stuff in my programs. No, no. We don't talk about money per se. We will down the road uh, because I'm mm. getting so many requests to talk about it. I'm like, okay, because I'm, I'm not a financial advisor. I'm a, you know, a, a, a teacher in trauma and it's all about self-worth and worthiness because the younger parts of you feel unworthy. So no matter how much you make, you're gonna find partners that are going to drain your account to match to the degree that you're worth until finally you say, I'm worth more. And you then say, no, I'm not available for anything unless it's this here at this level, but it takes some work. Yeah, thank you. And I have to blow the trumpet for being in the community. 
that you've created because Beautiful. it's already making a difference for me. Yeah, I saw a different I saw a change in you from week one to two. Like you're like just in your energy and you you might not have been on the call because it's late, but just the energy of how you're showing up completely changes because we're getting at it. We're healing from a body based level. We're not just talk. It's not just hot air. You're actually doing the work. And I can see that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Amazing. Be you, beautiful. Thank you so much for Thanks. for your question and your and the courage to share. You know, I, I'm really humbled by by the courage of the peeps in our community. Um, we live in a world which is, you know, full of shit, right? And for good reason, because we're all hiding parts of ourselves. Because, you know, if you saw the real me, you're not going to love me. You're going to abandon me. You're going to leave me. And these are our wounded parts of us that are calling on us to heal. And I would love to, I love working with people like Nicole, who say enough is enough. I'm ready to invest in myself. I'm ready to scare the crap out of myself. I trust, I, I found a community and a guide that I really, I'm wise to receive some help from. It's, there's no shame in receiving help. And so for those of you who are ready to do the work, um, find a guide and a community to help you. And if you feel safe in this container, uh, definitely reach out, apply to work uh, with us. Let us know what outcomes you really want to create. Get specific, get help, invest in yourself. And... Um, See your life change in what within a year to feel worthy uh, of receiving love, to have a relationship that feels mutual, to feel worthy of abundance and say, yeah, I deserve stepping up and taking on more challenging roles. Um, I really want you to win. And um, the only way we can win is by going inward rather than pointing fingers, uh, at really working on seeing ourselves and dismantling the bonds that we have unconsciously to the traumas that we were raised in. Uh, as always, if you have any questions, please do ask them in the trigger proof group, post them there and um, go ahead and watch the replay or uh, ask questions. Uh, this, this video, there's a video Facebook live right now in the trigger proof group. Go ahead and write down your biggest takeaways and um, let me know if you have any other questions. Make sure you subscribe. And we'll see you at the next perfect time.